Next on BYUSN, how this BYU football season has changed expectations for the Big 12-bound Cougars. And is Jimmer Fredette hunting for gold in Paris in 2024? We oui, wee, oui, Jason. Welcome to BYU Sports Nation, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. It is Wednesday, November 9th. Hope you survived your election day. I am Spencer Linton. That is Jason Shepard, a man who always has my vote. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I don't have my stickers on me. I'd give you a sticker okay. and say I voted for Jason Shepard, but I, I don't have those. Political endeavors in your future, Jason? No, it is most <laughs> certainly not. Most certainly. I'm very happy doing what I'm doing. What is in your future? Uh, how about uh, the future of today's show? Yes. Uh, how has this BYU football season changed your expectations of what's possible next season in the Big 12. Also, as we just mentioned, Jimmer Fredette, a.k.a. Slick Nick. He'll join us to talk USA 3-on-3 three in three the new BYU Hoop season, plus the latest Deep Blue features an inspiring story of BYU cheerleader Paige Moore. But first, let's get to today's headlines. BYU football in the midst of enjoying their bye week, and by enjoying it, we mean they're still working. <laughs> and according to head coach Kalani Satake, He's working on those fundamentals. Well, I mean, I think we just keep working hard and get, getting back to the, the basics. I, I think uh, the, the wins help confirm that the, the growth and the progress is being made. But I think when they see it on film, they can see the, the fundamentals improving too. Uh, the little things, the simple things that you can control. And you see it week to week, even through, throughout the season. BYU still controls their ability to win seven regular season games, get to a bowl game, win that for an eighth, and we'll see how we feel about the season after that. Satake also said he hopes to get some injured guys back for the Utah Tech game in a little over a week. No specifics on who those injured guys are that he hopes to have back. Women's basketball lost its season opener on the road last night at Colorado State, 82 to 62. Cougs were outscored in the second half, 47 to 23. Ari Mackey Williams led the Cougs in scoring with 18 points. She also knocked down four of her seven three-point shots. Okay. BYU back in action Saturday afternoon at the Marriott Center. It's the home opener, 4 p.m. Eastern, against Montana State on the BYU TV app. BYU women's tennis wrapping up their fall season with wins at the Rice Invitational. Four of BYU's doubles teams went two and one over the weekend. They will resume play in January. BYU baseball announcing some signings, and you'll see them throughout the rest of the day. But the ones that are in officially, Max Stanley has signed with BYU. He's a pitcher from Parker, Colorado. Crew McChesney, yes, younger brother Jackson McChesney, is an outfielder from Highland, or excuse me, from Highland, Utah. Uh, Maddox Peck is a pitcher, a pitcher from Riverton, Utah, and Walker Sanders, an outfielder from Lamar, Mississippi. That's a uh, starting to get a, a pipeline into Mississippi. I kind of like that. A wide recruiting net that includes now states in the South. BYU Women's Soccer also announces a couple of signees, including Hallie Dixon, a midfielder out of Carlsbad, California. She's joined by Ellie Ford, a midfielder from Provo, Utah, and Tim View High School. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. You won't beat that Ah, oh, how the expectations shift in this ever-changing BYU sports world, specifically for BYU football, Jason, as now midweek of this bye week, we send it forward to now thinking about BYU in the Big 12. At this point next year, where will the Cougars be in terms of a record and production? Who's the quarterback going to be, for crying out loud? So many different things are going to be in play for BYU football next year. But this season and previous seasons are certainly shaping expectations for BYU fans and for us here in Studio B on what to really expect once BYU gets into the Big 12. So let's just zero in on this season. Right now, BYU 5-5. Five and five. How has this season modified your expectations for BYU in year one of Big 12 football? I don't know if it's necessarily modified anything. I'm not sure that's the word that I would use. I, I think the word I would use is probably reinforced what I knew was going to be the case going in. Oh. And it's, it's not going to be easy. And that doesn't mean that I'm not optimistic. But I, I think we, we all need to realize 
what BYU is about to do is a big time step. And that doesn't mean that if BYU comes out and isn't winning every game right out of the gate, that, that everything is all for naught. You're taking a massive step up in competition week in and week out. Everything is different. And so for me, I always knew that. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not hopeful. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean I'm not optimistic that things can progress quick enough that maybe some of the lulls you don't have to go through as long, but it reinforces just how difficult a step this is for BYU. And look, the good news for BYU is they have other people's track record to look at. Now, far be it for me to use Utah as an example. Oh, but you, you know kind of have to. You know it hurts me, but... You kind of have to. They were in this situation. In fact, there's only two other teams that have been in this situation where you've gone from a G5 conference to P5 status. That's Utah and that's TCU. So I looked back at both of those schools and what they did and what I specifically looked at was how long did it take these teams before they were above 500 okay. in conference? Because okay. that's what I'm looking at. For Utah, it took them three years. From They went in in 11. By the first time they were above 500 was 14. Okay. For TCU, it took them two years. And they had one heck of a – they were 8-1 and one in 14. But so, I mean, it's, it's, there is a track record of teams that have done this that even good programs – there's an adjustment period, and I hope people realize that, and I hope people don't look at that as a negative thing. Okay. It's what has to happen as you make this step up. Okay. So I think it reinforces to me how difficult this is and that it puts everything into perspective. Again, you can be hopeful, and maybe, maybe BYU can buck the trend. That's what we all hope. But going in expecting that, I think there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be disappointed. Let me talk to my video game friends. Okay, and I know a lot of you love to play video games. Even our older generation at one point, you played video games probably. This is BYU football going from beginner to advanced level, Jason. I know that you're a big Pac-Man guy, big Mario guy, or not. <laughs> love him. <laughs> okay? Love him, of course. You are, you are now advancing from level one, stage one in the first ever Mario game, now directly into Bowser's Castle in level six or seven, okay? Th this is what BYU football is doing. It, is, it does not take a ton of logic to comprehend that BYU is going from beginner to advanced, or for NCAA 2014 video game fans, you're going from varsity level to all-American all level. If I may, to use your Nintendo Super Mario Brothers analogy, Please. For, for all the people, I think you'll understand this. If you truly want to be the best at Super Mario Brothers, you take it level after level after level. You know when you get in, into trouble? When you warp. When you try and warp and when you warp your way through. And you skip a couple of worlds, <laughs> and then you're like, wait, 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 this is coming at me too fast. That's what I'm saying. We live in a world where people want shortcuts, though, so I'm glad you brought that up. Like, there is no warp zone for BYU football to automatically go into the Big 12 and just be awesome. That does not exist in the reality of college football as we know it. BYU, sure, they might go into year one of the Big 12, and let's say they end up with a winning record. Incredible. That doesn't, that doesn't qualify as a warp zone. I mean, a warp, people want BYU to automatically be a top 25 team and be competing for one of the top tier bowl games that are tied to the Big 12. It just does not seem realistic. It seems unfair to Coach Satake yes. and his staff and the players that come back to heap those expectations on them where it's like, well, BYU won 11 games in 2020, and they won 10 games in 2021. A little bit of a drop-off last year, but, I mean, the trend is BYU's probably going to win 9 or 10 games. It's, it just feels unfair. It feels unfair to do that. You're going from beginner to advanced. It's going to take a little while. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to throw the controller a little bit. Okay? You're going to lose <laughs> Sounds it. like somebody's throwing are gonna some be controllers. Like, hey! Turn it off <laughs> and calm down, okay? Turn it off because I am not buying you another controller. BYU. And we're talking case studies. So yes. I'm glad you brought up TCU in Utah. I thought, okay, well, let's look at BYU's unique stance within independence and go back four to five years and just look how BYU has fared against Power 5 competition. So if we include 2018-2019, 2020 BYU didn't play any Power 5s out of their control because of the COVID scenario. 
played seven Power Fives in 2021, and have played four thus far with Stanford still looming. In those 20 games, BYU's record, 11-9. and nine. Okay, pretty good, including 6-1 in 2021. Now, Jason, we need to look at this with a, a little bit of a lens that sees Jaron Hall and Zach Wilson as the quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. Okay, BYU had two very, very good quarterbacks in this scenario. They had an NFL running back in Tyler Algier over the last two years, not to mention Dax Milne and a bunch of other NFL guys in that five-year span. BYU's had really good players. So much of this game is based around your quarterback. So while I would love to say, okay, BYU's going to win 55% of the games in the Big 12 next year. They're going to go five and four. That, that would be fantastic. But that's assuming that BYU's quarterback is going to be locked and loaded, ready to go, and is going to be on the level of Jaron Hall. And I think that, too, is unfair. We don't know who BYU's quarterback is going to be next year, leading them into the Big 12. Jacob Conover is there. Cade Fennigan is there. I feel strongly BYU is going to attack the transfer portal hard, go after some JUCO guys potentially, and see what else is out there. We have no idea who the quarterback is going to be, and that is a major point of concern. You, you know as well as yeah. I know that football is so much about who your quarterback yes. is. Yes, yes. It's so much about who your quarterback is. It's, it's the number one position in all of sports. So if BYU has a capable quarterback and they bring back a solid offensive line, I think it's fair to say go four and five in the Big 12. Go four and five at your nine games, win two of your three non-conference games, and get to six and six. So my expectations, to answer the original question, really have not shifted from a year ago and from before this season, certainly, I felt like BYU was capable of going 6-6. Six and six. That still requires BYU to go out and get a capable quarterback. Not an elite quarterback, just give me a capable quarterback that maybe can build towards something special a couple of years into the Big 12. It's going to get tougher. BYU can go 2-1, and one, beat Southern Utah, beat Sam Houston State, who knows what happens at Arkansas, and then win four of the nine yep. Big 12 games. Again, out of the last 20 Power 5 games over the last five years, 11-9, and nine, but that's with Zach Wilson primarily and Jaron Hall, a little bit of Tanner Mangum sprinkled in there. So I feel like maybe 40% wins against Power 5 competition is a fair expectation, which then, and I'm shouting out to my guy Cougar Stats, he'll love this because over the course of BYU football, it's been about a 40% win rate against Power 5 competition. I think that's a fair way to shape this thing. Well, and look, and it's, I just, I hope people go in with the right frame of mind. It doesn't, doesn't. It's a lot to ask, It doesn't, right? it doesn't, it doesn't dampen your excitement for what's ahead. Look, I'm, I'm as excited as anybody. I've been wanting this for as long as I can remember, you know, that we knew this was a possibility and whether BYU is going to be in or out over the last decade. Like, I, I have been a proponent of this. I cannot wait for it. I'm, I'm as pumped as anybody. But go in with the right frame of mind that this is going to take some time, and that's okay. Look, a perfect example. Now, this is a local example, but a perfect example of this is what we're seeing right now with the Utah Jazz. The Utah Jazz tore down and were in a rebuild mode. Everybody thought that they were going to be horrible to start this year. Everybody sort of readjusted, and you're like, you know what? I'm going to enjoy the journey. I like where we're going. I can see a future, but I'm going to enjoy things along the way. If, if, somebody, if they surprise us along the way, great. Well, guess what? The Utah Jazz have the best record in the Western Conference right now. Nobody saw that coming. So we're not saying that, this, that BYU can't come out of the gate and be hot out of the gate and win. We're just saying don't expect something like that because the track record of others who have done it says it's very, very difficult to do. So go in with the right frame of mind, enjoy the process, and enjoy where the program is going and the ride along the way. It all comes down to Danny Ainge, doesn't it? Yes, There's it does. your BYU <laughs> there tie the Utah Jazz, there we go. not Ryan Smith, the owner. Some BYU guys involved in that process there. Uh, for, listen, Jason, six and six. And, and maybe, like I had a thought this morning where I was like, is six and six too ambitious of a thought for BYU next year? Because looking at the Utah example you brought up, yeah, it took them a little more than three years to get to that over 500 record. They had a couple of losing seasons in their overall. Yes. Season. Well, the, second, the, the, first year, the, the first year for the University of Utah, they had a winning record overall. They were 8-5 and five overall, but 4-5 and five in, in the Pac-12. The second year, 
in, in fact, the, the second and third year, they were two games under 500 overall, two back-to-back -back five and seven yes. seasons, and three and six in Pac-12 play, and then two and seven. Okay, so this is a possibility. It is a possibility. It would be unfair to say that it's not like, oh, well, BYU has, they have played in an independent schedule, like the transition's not going to be as rough. There may be a little bit of truth to that. BYU is not going from a group of five schedule to a power five schedule. So maybe, and I think that's fair, BYU is yes. a little ahead of the curve in understanding what it's going to be like to now transition to a full power five. Yes, I believe, the, I believe BYU, because of what they've done as an independent and the scheduling that they've had, yes. they are more prepared going into year one than probably Utah and TCU. Now, now what that results in, term, in terms of wins and losses, there's no way to know. The coaches have a better understanding. Yes. Certainly Coach yes. Take knows, like, okay, we faced seven power fives last year. And even this year, Jason, with the five power fives, but look at the group of five teams BYU has faced. Boise State, ECU, Liberty, we're finding out, all pretty good. Boise State's probably the worst of those three teams. How crazy know, is that? That's pretty Liberty and ECU better right. than Boise State. So the Cougars are more acclimated from a staff perspective and from players having gone through it to transitioning into a full Power 5 schedule, but they're still not quite there yet. This season has just reinforced my expectations that the Cougars can go 4-5 and five in the first nine games of Big 12 play. They can win two of the three in non-con, be 6-6 six and six and go to a bowl game, and I think that would be a nice accomplishment in year one because your quarterback is leaving and because Puka Nakua is probably leaving. Who are the new stars going to be? It's, it's gonna Lay the groundwork time. in a new yes. chapter yes. in the athletic program. It's okay. Yes. 6-6 six and six is okay. Totally fair to expect that. Look, and then, and then hope for more. But set your expectations realistic. I don't know if that's possible on this show. <laughs> For this fan base. Let's go to Voice of the Nation. Our question of the day. Has this season... 2022 campaign for BYU football changed your expectations for BYU's first Big 12 season. Justin Park on Twitter says, What expectations? Show up and learn and earn that money the first couple of years. Three years to be a contender in the Big 12, book it. What does a contender mean, I wonder, in Justin's mind? Does that mean finishing in the top four? Does it mean finishing in the top two? Like a con that, that is a loaded way to phrase that. I, I, think three, I think three to five years in the Big 12 is realistic to be looking for getting towards the top of the conference. It took Utah 10 years, 10 years to win the Pac-12. Yep. Okay? Okay. It is, it is a long road sometimes. All right. Catch up on the latest BYU football with Kalani Satake as the coach. And the players recap the Boise State game. And it's combined with the season debut of BYU basketball with Mark Pope. It's available on demand on BYUSN.com and the BYU TV app. Joining us next, the great Jimmer Fredette. He's a gold medalist. Does he have his eye on a run to another gold in 2024? We'll ask him next. This is BYU Sports Nation. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by the Tim Daly Auto Group, serving Utah since 1968. Tim Daly Ford in Spanish Fork sells Ford vehicles, including the F-150, the pickup designed for work and play. Tim Daly Ford maintains a large inventory, providing more choices for selecting an F-150 with the power and engineering to carry and tow heavy loads. The F-150's design offers comfort, safety, and a range of options to choose from. Think Ford. Think Tim Daly Ford in Spanish Fork.
Let's kick off AFR on BYU TV. What they did in that fourth quarter was not unexpected in my book. Everyone did their job perfectly, and it resulted in obviously a touchdown. Who knew that he had these kind of hands? And right at the snap of the football, they both go right downhill. And, and that was the end of that. <laughs> he, did, he, he knocked him down pretty quickly. Welcome back to BYU Sports Station, live in Studio B. This is your day-to-day -day BYU Sports play-by-play. -play. I am Spencer Linton. This is my video game savant. Sitting to my left, Jason Shepard. Never warp. <laughs> <laughs> you want it war world by world. World by level world, by level. level by level. Hey, I can Look, appreciate that. I it's very also... deep, by the way, if you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of context there for life, right? <laughs> Some object lessons. <laughs> Joining us now, and we're thrilled to have him back on the program, is the great Jimmer Fredette, who has just wrapped up a gold medal performance with Team USA in three-on-three -three basketball. Jimmer, welcome back to BYU Sports Nation, and congratulations on a gold medal. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to preface this, too. I have my little daughter here on the on the ground so if you hear some uh, some squealing that's that's what it is so <laughs> this is the show and fan base that one million percent can understand that so no problem absolutely. at all jim i knew that <laughs> yeah absolutely Let, let's just start with how you got into the three-on-three -three basketball realm like when did this become a thing for you and, and who approached you about it yeah no it was great i was actually uh so the, the coach's name is Fran Frischilla. It's actually his son, James, that coaches the team. And Fran's kind of like the GM. You may know Fran. He's uh, been an ESPN personality for a long time. He was coach for a long time, uh, coach at New Mexico for a little while. So he's very familiar with the Mountain West Conference. Uh, he actually lives in Colorado Springs, um, you know, where US, USA sports kind of, you know, is, resides. And uh, I actually got in contact with him through one of my former teammates, Jonathan Tavernari. Um, he talks with uh, with Fran uh, quite often and asks him about um, who he thought would be good at three on three. And JT gave him my name, and Fran called me up, and and uh, I I said, yeah, I would love to have the opportunity because there's an opportunity possibly to go towards um, you know 2024 Olympics in three on three basketball. So for me, I was I was all in right away just to be able to have an opportunity to possibly do that was, was something that caught my eye. Well, and look it. Not just the fact that you guys won gold, but you hit the game-winning shot. Look, and everybody <laughs> knows that you've had a lot of big shots in your career. Where does that one rank for you personally? You know, it's it's great. I mean, it's definitely up there. When you win a gold medal, you make a game-winning shot. You know, the excitement afterwards was awesome. I mean, we were just, you know, we were yelling at each other, and you know, I'm super excited. And it, it was funny because we were playing against Puerto Rico in the final. And we're down in Miami, so it actually felt like a road game. You know, eighty percent of the people there were were going from Puerto Rico, and uh, you know, so be able to make the shot, win win a win a gold medal for the U.S. Mm. Um, in the America Cup was was a lot of fun. So it was up there for sure because it was so exciting. You've tasted gold at the America Cup as you just brought up, but I want to go back to something that you just mentioned in your previous comment, and that is making a run at the Olympics. Uh, Jimmer, is, is it fair to say that, that you're ready to make a run at gold in Paris with Team USA in 2024? Yeah, well, I mean, first got to get there. You know, I mean, that's the biggest thing. Um, three on three basketball came uh, to the Olympics last last Olympics in uh, Tokyo in 2020. And unfortunately, our our team didn't qualify for, uh, you know, for three on three basketball there. So that's why they're kind of making a real push to make sure that we obviously first qualify for the Olympics and then hopefully make a run for a medal. Um, but the teams that we're playing against all, you know, a lot of these European teams, Serbia and Lithuania and some of these teams, have been playing three on three basketball on a circuit for, you know, years and years and years. They're kind of the gold standard. They do this for their living. Uh, they play all year round. They know how to play. They're good players. They're physical. You know, it's a much more physical game and just kind of different than five on five. So we're trying to catch up um, on how to play the game. Obviously we have a lot of talent and we're bringing some of that talent to the game, but trying to learn the ins and outs of it is something that we're, we're working on. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, hopefully, you know, the whole the whole goal of this is to be able to make the 2024 Olympics and hopefully be able, be able to make a run at a medal. Look, the the obvious answer is there's two less players. But what what's the and, and you mentioned, you know, you're starting to see a little bit more of the big three in the United States. I mean, obviously you have you have the big three ice cubes league. 
and that's gaining popularity and the three on three tournaments, you're starting to see more and more of that. What's the biggest difference in playing three on three, you know, versus a normal five on five game? Well, even in, uh, you know, different between the three on three that they play here, like the big three and some of the game scoop it ups and all those things is that it's continuous basketball. So literally once you shoot it and you make it, the other team catches it and throws it out past the three point line, they clear it and you just keep playing. So it's continuous, which makes it exhausting to be honest with you, because you don't get any breaks, right? Like unless there's a foul um, or, you know, it goes out of bounds or something like that. You, you don't stop until that happens. So you can play sometimes for two, three minutes in a row and you have to play offense, defense, one-on-one -on -one defense, uh, getting over screens. There's so many different actions that they run, you know, in three on three versus five on five to get guys open. So there's a lot of screens and double screens and rescreens and slipping to the basket and all this different stuff. So you have to really be able to think on the fly um, and it's all obviously half court and you don't get a chance to like walk the ball up the court or anything like that. It's continuous. So it's, it's very tiring. It's, it's a lot of fun, but it, if you can be in really good shape and you have a uh, smart basketball IQ and then you can make twos, um, you could be pretty good at it. And I feel like it, you know, it fits my game pretty well, but uh, yeah, it's that continuous basketball you have to get used to. Jimmer Fredette with us on BYU Sports Nation. Jimmer, What's the key to growing the popularity of three on three basketball in the United States to join some of those European juggernauts? You know, I just think it's about finding a, the right league for it to happen, right? And obviously, there's not, you know, a five on five basketball. That's where, where all the money is, right? That's, that's where people get paid, and whether it's overseas, whether it's here. Um, so if someone can, you know, find a league where guys are getting paid decent, obviously on the FIBA World Tour, you do make money the, um, for these tournaments. You can make a decent, decent living doing it. You just have to be able to travel all over the world to be able to play in this. So if they had a league here in the U.S. where they could make some money, you know, that's obviously the big three's trying to do it. But if they had a league that was like FIBA where they played FIBA rules um, and everything, then we would get better at it. And if people, then you'd see more talent because they want to stay here and possibly have a chance to play on the U S Olympic team, um, be able to make some money. It's, you know, a little bit less you know, travel and a little bit less time commitment, maybe than a five on five, um, you know, season. So there's, there's some ins and outs that people I think would like. Um, but it's about ultimately trying to find a good league that's going to, you know, pay for people to be able to, to make a living um, doing it. That's what's going to attract more talent. All right. I've got a hypothetical for you, Jimmer. Let's say you and one other guy are looking for a third person to form a three on three team. Would you want Slick Nick on your team? <laughs> You know, all, yes, I would. The problem is Slick Nick was a little out of shape. Yeah, I, I don't know if he can quite play that continuous, but he does have a little bit of, you know, girth to him, so he could probably body some of the bigger guys. Um, you know, I, I, think he would, I think he would do okay. I think he would do okay, but, uh, you know, ultimately Slick Nick is in retirement. So. Yeah, I don't think Slick Nick screams Olympics at this point with that body shape for sure, Jimmer. Not quite, not quite. <laughs> but what's what's the next step for you in, in this progression chart towards you know qualifying for the Olympics? What what has what happens next, tournament or or preparation wise? Yeah, so they're getting close to the end of the season for three on three. Um, you know, so they mostly play from like May to like the end of November. Uh, it's kind of how they work that schedule. Uh, obviously, because it's mostly outdoors. There's some indoor events, but they do a lot of it outdoor with a covered top and everything, that type of deal. Um, so they'll start again in May. Uh, we'll have world championships in May or sometime next summer. I'm not sure exactly the dates yet, but we've qualified for that. So we'll be able to go to the world championships and be able to do that. And then obviously I'll, I'll play on, uh, you know, the FIBA world tour this summer, um, which is going to be all over the world. There'll be some in Europe, some in Canada, uh, maybe a few in the U S there's some in Asia. Uh, now I won't play in every event, but I'll play in a lot of them, try to get acclimated because you know you have to qualify as a player to be able to make the olympic team uh, you have to accumulate enough points to be able to do that but then also your team has to accumulate enough points to qualify for paris so we'll be trying to do both things simultaneously and obviously the more i play the better i'll get to be prepared you know for an olympic run so yeah i'll be doing that some this summer uh playing and uh you know trying to get better and uh hoping to make an olympic run 
So with that in mind, big picture basketball questions then, what is your basketball future? Is, is this what you, the basketball that you're going to be playing for the next little while, preparing for this? Or do you have other opportunities uh, in the basketball world? Where do things stand with that? Yeah, I've had several opportunities that came up for me, five on five, all over the world, um, in Europe, in China, Australia, Japan, I mean, everywhere. Um, people have asked me to come over. I just wasn't prepared to do that at this point. Um, you know, so I had declined, uh, you know, at this point, all the, the offers that have come. And we'll see about after January if something comes up that's really great that I want to try to, you know, take. So I wouldn't shut that door fully. Um, but at the same time, I'm super happy with where I'm at. Um, I'm able to be home with the family, uh, be able to spend the holidays here, uh, obviously continue to work on my three on three stuff. Cause that's ultimate goal is to, to make an Olympic run. Um, so I want to be able to do that, but to be able to go over and play uh, five on five for a month or two, maybe something that's an option. Um, uh, but as of right now, I'm not thinking about that too much. I'm mostly thinking about this three on three stuff and, and being home with basketball and or with my family and being able to kind of do some other things on the side. So, uh, so that's where my head's at right now, but yeah, I have, I haven't, uh, you know, accepted any offers for the five on five at this point, but on purpose. Jimmer Fredette on BYU Sports Nation. Now we shift our attention to the new version of BYU men's basketball. I know Slick Nick has had a firsthand <laughs> experience with Coach Mark Pope and this specific team. Weird game the other night, but we saw a bunch of yeah. powerhouses lose on opening night. So maybe yeah. there's just something to winning and finding a way. But what are your impressions yeah. early of this BYU men's basketball team? Yeah, I mean, the first games are always tough, right? Like, you're just so amped up. You're so excited to finally play in a meaningful game after, like, several months of just workouts and playing against each other and, you know, doing defense and, you know, conditioning and all of these different things. You're just so excited to be able to get out there and play against another opponent. You never really know what is going to happen as far as that's concerned. Most importantly, it's about winning the game. And uh, I love their effort. They played hard, and that's the biggest thats the biggest thing for me. If they're playing hard, they're going to be good defensively. Um, then it's about just being consistent on the offensive end and being able to score. I thought Dallin did an amazing job coming in and providing a spark for the team. Um, you know, I think he's going to be a really good player. Obviously, Spencer, you see, hit that big shot at the end. Um, they have some veteran guys. Um, it's going to take them a little time to gel because there are, <laughs> there's a lot of new guys on this team. But ultimately, they have good talent. They have good athleticism. They have great coaching. Um, they're going to play hard defensively. Now it's about finding that rhythm offensively. Who's their go-to guy down the stretch? Who's going to make plays for them? Um, if they can do that, I think they'll be really solid um, because they're going to be good defensively. This time next year, we're all going to be focusing on looking ahead to the conference schedule in the Big 12. Can you imagine if your schedule had – you know, Kansas coming to Provo and Baylor, <laughs> Texas Tech and going to all these places. What an unbelievable yeah. basketball league this is going to be next year. It's unbelievable. I mean, I keep telling people, I was like, last year, if, if you were, you know, in the Big 12, your easiest road game would have been at West Virginia. <laughs> and I'm like, that's Bob Huggins and the Mountaineers and their crazy fan base. Like, that would have been your ease because their their record in the the, the actual um, conference wasn't great. And I'm like, that's a really good team. That's an extremely difficult place to play. So there's just no nights off. Um, there is the complete, um, you know, you have to be on and ready to go every single night. And that may be a little bit different coming from the West Coast Conference where, you know, you play some games where you feel like you can, you know, not play your A game and win. Um, that's not the case in the Big 12. So it's just being on every single night preparing i know the guys will be super excited about it um you know because those venues are going to be amazing to play at um but it's about just going out there having fun and putting forth the best effort and you know putting together a game plan i think i think it'll take an adjustment period but ultimately i think we're going to be good in a few years jimmer great to catch up with you and really exciting uh, to hear about the gold medal uh, pursuit and your ambitions in three-on-three -three basketball we appreciate the time and please send our best to whitney and your beautiful kids man hope things are going well there as well Everything, everything is good. I appreciate everyone. It's, it's an exciting new chapter. It's been great, and uh, I always appreciate the support, guys. All right, you guys. Thanks, Jimmer Fredette on BYU Sports Nation, the GOAT. He's, he's the great Jimmer, and I love that his basketball career has just taken him to so many yes. unique places and now into three-on-three -three basketball. I don't know, just for a minute while he was talking about Olympic basketball, I thought, how fun would it be to watch Jimmer yeah. with Team USA playing 
representing the red, white, and blue in Paris in 20. That would be absolutely unbelievable. Oh. Anytime you have the opportunity to put USA on your chest and represent the United States, I, that would be it. That's that's there's not Jimmer, many things an, better than as that. an Olympian. Can you imagine like how much the country would love that? Yeah, it'd be fantastic. Jimmer mania going to the With Olympics. Returns He's going to the Olympics. All right. After further review, recaps the Boise State game and what a fun game it was. Watch it on demand on BYUSN.com or the BYU TV app. And up next, was the real secret to success in Boise, Jason, a tasty burger? Does it come down to a good burger the night before? This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. about BYU Sports Nation. It's a banner that unites fans all over the world. BYU TV and BYU Radio are all about bringing your family events and games live. On air, online, and on the free apps. It's the next best thing to being there. Connecting your fandom with others across BYU Sports Nation. Download the apps and get exclusive access to analysis and interviews with players and coaches. BYU TV and BYU Radio. The place for all things Cougar sports. Tune in. Join in. This is BYU Sports Nation. To interact with the show and get great content throughout the day, follow us on our social media platforms on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. He is Jason Shepard. I am Spencer Linton. You know what time it is. Let's whip it. Cougar Whip Around presented by Marisk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. After the win over Idaho State, uh, BYU basketball is no longer listed in the next four out category in the latest bracketology. How dare they? Uh, would a win at San Diego State on Friday night put BYU back on the bubble? Absolutely it would. We're talking about the 19th ranked team in the country right now. A road win at Viejas always resonates with the people that care about making brackets and talking about early season quad one win opportunities. And it'll resonate on the Ken Pomeroy stat sheet. Yes, BYU would be right back on the bubble. It's that prominent yes. of an opportunity. Yes, San Diego State has that much clout. As you mentioned, ranked 19th. And let's not forget, this is a future P5 match up between the Big 12 and the Pac-12. Ooh. See? You really think San Diego State's going to end up in the Pac-12? I'm going to know. Dan Patrick was very adamant this was happening. And everybody that, that uh, sort of like tried to push it away, they didn't say it wasn't going to happen. They pushed away on the time frame. Uh, okay. So we will see. Right. We will see. Hey, more BYU-San Diego State matchups. I yep. love that in basketball for sure. In the latest college football playoff rankings, Jason, future Big 12 comrade and foe, TCU, is ranked number four. The undefeated Horned Frogs have a shot, Jason. Are you cheering for TCU to make the college football playoff right now? Look, in the Mountain West days, I really hated TCU very much. But I think I am for the good of the conference. And how long has it been since you've been able to say that? I'm so excited. <laughs> so, yes. Let's go Horn Frogs. BYU is not in the Big 12 right now, so it makes it a little easier for you. Well, they, you know, there, have, there hasn't been any incidents, you know, on the field <laughs> where we get really angry at each other. 
so. it's been long enough since that 5150 yeah. debacle oh. in 2005 and them ruining BYU's quest for perfection in 2008. Uh, what, what about you? Are you pulling for them? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I let's, am. let's pull for them. I just like the fact that it's something different. Yes. Right? The fact that Alabama's not in the top four and there's TCU. Maybe Oregon's got an outside shot. What? All right, we've talked about bracketology. How about the latest bowl projections oh, for I BYU? Oh, I some good bowl projections. All right, according to ESPN, Cougs in the Lending Tree Bowl versus Troy. Some guy named Troy. I kid. Or the New Mexico Bowl versus San Jose State. CBS has the Cougars in the Armed Forces Bowl okay. versus SMU. All right. Uh, Sports Illustrated, the Independence Bowl versus Cincinnati. No. The, the Athletic First Responder Bowl versus UNLV. Eh. And USA Today, the First Responder Bowl versus Iowa State. Your favorite matchup is the win. Oh, is what? It's the First Responder Bowl in Texas against Iowa State. Mm. Though I do like the pre-Christmas Bowl scenario. Uh, so maybe the Armed Forces Bowl against high-scoring SMU yeah. could be a fun game. Yeah, I, I always say it'd be fun. I don't want BYU to go back to Shreveport. They did that last year. I've seen enough of Shreveport. Been there twice in the last year. I'm good. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I think the USA Today, the first responder bowl versus Iowa State, a little preview of things okay. to come. So I'm cool with that one. Jason, a Boise State fan posted a picture of Jaron Hall and several key members of his offensive line eating burgers at Five Guys the night before BYU broke the losing streak at Boise State and won on the blue. It was a tasty burger, some secret sauce, or the secret sauce for BYU turning things around. Look, I don't know if it was. I, but if that's gonna help, whatever. We got we got a five guys right down the road. <laughs> we'll, we'll see you next. We'll see you next Friday night before the game against Utah Tech. Jaron, I fully anticipate that you will be taking your offensive line to five guys Friday night before the Utah Tech game, and find a five guys somewhere in Palo Alto as well. Yes, they've got them. They've keep got them. Keep it rolling, if, man. I don't know if it worked, but if that's what it was, keep her keep her going. Yes. Let's do it. All right, BYU Women's Soccer NCAA Tournament coming up Friday, hosting Utah Valley Friday at 8 Eastern time. You can hear that on BYU Radio and the BYU Radio app. Vengeance match. Yes. That's next, a story of perseverance in this week's Can't Miss Deep Blue. How about some love for the cheerleaders? This is BYU Sports Match. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Maersk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. If you're looking to build your brand awareness and increase market share as BYU moves into the Big 12, this is the place, BYU, BYU Athletics. Athletics. We can provide the tools you need to make sure your company is seen and heard. BYU Athletics is where you can align your products and services with loyal fans that cheer for our Cougars. And they can also help your business win. Learn more about what a partnership with BYU Athletics and your company will look like. After all, this is the place. Email sponsorship at byu.edu today. Football in Utah is all about the rivalries. Red, Ooh, quarterback, wide out, rewards. Wait, what? My style, checking rewards. My style, right. For Mountain America's My Style Checking, it's all about the benefits. Loan discounts. But it's hard to pick a favorite. No, mobile phone protection. Tell the hell. You're going to need that when we're done. I heard that. Let's go. Get the account rivaled by no one. My Style Checking from Mountain America. My name is Spencer Finnegan. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. During my sophomore year, I got married to my sweetheart, Mary. And there's tons of unexpected expenses when it comes to marriage. We were looking for scholarships. I found the replenishment grant, and my local alumni chapter gave me a grant to help me focus in on school. I'm so excited to now that I've graduated, give back to those students that are coming to BYU in the future. Sports Nation live in Studio B. Jason Shepard and Spencer Linton here. And I'm gathering all of you watching and listening have at some point heard the phrase, if at first you don't succeed, 
Try, Try Again. What you may not know is that originates from 1857 in Edward Hickson's moral song. And regardless of origin, we all kind of buy into the sentiment, right? It applies to Paige Moore, specifically, who overcame multiple concussions in a pursuit to finally live out her dream as a BYU cheerleader. Spring of 2015, my senior year of high school, my mom and I come down to BYU for me to try out for the BYU cheer team. And I don't make it. She could have gone and cheered at a different school, but she didn't want to. She wanted to come to BYU. This had been her dream since she was a little girl. 2016, I'm here at BYU, and I decide to try out again. We get the call at the end of the day, didn't make it again. And then the spring of 2017, I again decide, third time's the charm, I'm gonna try out for BYU cheer. This kid is amazing. Whatever it is, she's not quite there yet. 2018, spring rolls around and I'm, I'm thinking about trying out. She had a severe ankle injury that put her out for the whole summer. Occasionally, we have kids who are persistent enough to come back one, maybe two times. In my 21 years of coaching, Paige is the first person that I've had that's actually come back that many times. She wasn't proud of the fact that she didn't make it to to be you chair, so she kept it pretty hidden. When she was six, I started her in gymnastics, and that set her off. When the lights came on, it's when she shined the best. That was the beginning of who Paige is. When I was about nine, I was working on some specific strength-oriented skills on beam, and I ended up overdoing it, and I injured my shoulder. So we just took her to the doctors, and um, they just told us to quit and that wasn't the answer she wanted. It was cartwheels to the table. It's, this is what she did. It's what we always saw her doing. So for her to have that year off, it was kind of devastating for her in some ways until she could overcome that injury. I ended up trying out for my high school cheer team to somewhat try and fill that void that gymnastics had left me. She's fearless. She shouldn't care. She'll try anything. While I was cheering in high school, I had a few concussions. The most notable or significant probably happened when I was at a basketball game. And she was in a, in some sort of a stunt up in the air. She was always willing to do whatever they wanted to try, so it put her in line for getting injured pretty easily. I was flying in the air up in a stunt during a timeout, and when the timeout was ending, the referee decided to come out onto the court, and he was moving backward and he was moving really fast and as he was backing up he ran into my bases the girls underneath me that were holding me up and she got dropped to the ground and to sit in the into the stands and see her plop to the ground and bounce and everybody just gasps when that happens it wasn't something you want to see however i i did get up and i kind of powered through the rest of the game i probably shouldn't have and now i know i shouldn't have and that kind of set in motion the symptoms for a lot of these concussions. In July of 2017, I was in a car accident. I got T-boned. While I walked away from the accident that day, seemingly just fine, I started to develop some symptoms as the days and weeks rolled on. And it seemed like all of the symptoms that she'd had from prior concussions just piled back on her. I started picking up on things like headaches and dizziness and being tired. And when she opened up about how she was throwing up every day and how she was getting really exhausted doing simple tasks, I thought that was a bit odd. She just wasn't really getting better. And so I think those were sort of compounded from the previous concussions she had. She visited a few doctors and they thought it was maybe something wrong with her. Um, digestive system and her digestive tract. Um, at one point, they even wanted to, to take out her gallbladder. They thought that might be the solution. It was frustrating to kind of have this misdiagnosis or feel like I wasn't getting anywhere and that I would maybe just have to deal with it. But in the meantime, she was starting to fall behind in school and ended up withdrawing from most of her classes. And I did start improving symptomatically, but I was living a fraction of the life that I had been before. She had actually been working here at CFX as an intern, and then also as what we call a PCC, or a patient care coordinator. And she happened to be sharing with her colleagues some of the symptoms she was having. And my partner, Dr. Mark Allen, here at the clinic, he overheard her and turned to her and said, 
Have you considered a brain injury? And up to that point, she had never really thought of that. Now, Paige, after delving a bit more clinically and asking her some questions, um, we found out that she had had seven concussions up to that point. And, and again, her medical doctors were doing the best they could, but if you're not fully aware of all the physiologic, the emotional, the cognitive, the sleep problems that a concussion can cause, you don't know to draw uh, th those, those lines to those dots. And with that, I was rapidly scheduled for a functional MRI, and when the MRI came back and we got the results, they immediately decided to book treatment for me. Based on my diagnosis and the functional MRI that I received, we were then able to put together a treatment plan where I could perform physical, cognitive, and other therapies and activities to both work my brain, to reactivate it, and then also rest my brain to get it to recover properly. So that way I could heal from this long-standing injury. Their clinic and the work that they did for me there was nothing short of life-changing. I could not be here today without them. It truly makes me laugh when I look back and think that I started working at a brain injury clinic while having a brain injury. Following my fourth year at BYU, I realized I had one more year for my undergrad due to taking time off from my injury. And I remember our conversation we had driving back from a vacation in St. George, and it got kind of quiet, and she, she looked at me and she's like, you know, Coop, I, I think I want to try out for BYU Cheer one more time. And I was kind of quiet, didn't say anything. And I looked at her and I said, are you okay to, to not make it one more time? She's like, yeah, I'm ready. To, I'm accepting my fate. You know, I'm, I'm willing to give my all. And if I fail one more time, so be it. But I want to try out. I think from just the previous years, what had happened, she didn't want to involve us emotionally. She just uh, made the decision on her own. I remember coming back down here to the Smithfield House, a place that held so many negative memories associated with not making cheer. And while being nervous, I remember walking in the door and feeling completely calm and way different than I had on any of my other tryout experiences. Paige calls me and she's really emotional and I'm like, I was scared. I thought something happened, that she, something happened to her. And so I, I was like, are you okay? And she goes, mom, I made it. And I was like, you what? And she goes, mom, I just made the cheer team. And I started crying. because her dream has always been my dream. And for her to go through what she's gone through and have so many setbacks, and then for her to quietly try it one more time. Making the BYU cheer team was an absolute dream come true. And then being able to cheer for three years on the team was even more than I thought I'd ever get. Paige's story goes even just a step further because I actually appointed her as captain. I was so impressed with someone who would have the persistence to come back that many times. It showed that she is forgiving. It showed that she was determined. It showed all these things that are attributes that I look for when I am trying to choose a leader on this team. I've never regretted it for a second. I truly lived my dream while on the BYU cheer team, but all dreams come to an end at some point in time. And with my master's degree finishing up and cheer finishing up, I had kind of put a nice closure on, uh, on BYU. And I loved every minute of it, and I wouldn't change a thing about it. But I stepped from that dream straight into another dream. I have been accepted to medical school, and I have been so blessed by those that have decided to study the brain and the body. And without them, I would not be where I'm at today. And now that I'm where I am today, I want to be able to do that for somebody else. I want to be able to help someone. And even if it's just one person that I help, all of it will have been worth it. More deep blues like Paige Moore's are available right now at BYUSN.com. Our elite voice is next. This is BYU Sports Nation.
BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Introducing the Truck for Adventure. The all-new 2022 Nissan Frontier doesn't compromise on power or comfort. This mid-sized truck was redesigned to incorporate the latest technology and designs for safety, comfort, and convenience. Plus, with up to 6,700 pounds of towing capacity and best-in-class horsepower, it's rugged enough for adventure and still safe enough to transport all your favorite people. Where's your new Frontier? You'll find it at Tim Dowling Nissan Southtown in South Jordan. Before I was a coach at BYU, or before I was even a player, I was a BYU fan. We've got great energy as a team, but we have even better energy because of our fans, and it's absolutely magical. When you hear the crowd roar, that makes it more exciting, more of an adrenaline rush. The roar of the crowd, you can feel it on the floor, you can feel that energy, and it's unlike anywhere else in the country. BYU sports, it's all about the fans. Ten seasons going from never knowing to finding answers. Wondering how you belong to finding where you fit. Ten seasons of questioning what might have been to embracing a bright future. I was able to put a big piece of my family together. I was getting answers that I had been wondering about. On Relative Race, new beginnings, new adventures, new connections. Stream a new season of Relative Race Season 10. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Welcome back to the show. Our question of the day, has this season changed your expectations for BYU football's first Big 12 season? Our elite voice of the day presented by PAX Healthcare Elevated comes from Garrett Jacobson on Twitter who says, look on the bright side. BYU's 1-0 against Big 12 teams this year. Look, I like the optimism. Got a win against the reigning Big 12 champs in Baylor, That's what right? what I'm talking about. I like it. Today's Rise and Shout Out presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Go out to Samson Nakua, who has just signed with the Pittsburgh Maulers of the USFL. Huge win for the Nakuas. Absolutely. Congratulations. Our Com thanks to today's guest, Jimmer Fredette. Conversation continues 24-7 on social media. All of our shows are on demand at BYUSN.com. For the great Jason Shepard, I am Spencer Linton. Shout out to Joe Herrick. Kickers matter. See you tomorrow back here in Studio B. Go Cougs.